Hi, Joyce. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. It's so lovely <laughs> to see you again. Lovely to see you. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. It's a nice day here. I'm looking out the window at my <laughs> garden. It's... A very fat groundhog is kind of walking around. Ah. <laughs> Well, you seem to have a lot of wildlife around you because uh, you you recently posted on social media about a raccoon that's been entering your house at night. Uh, well, which... the maybe, yeah, maybe more, maybe more than one. Oh, but right! Wow. Stopped it now. Ah, okay, yeah. The it, uh, it must have been very disconcerting because um, the the way you described it sounded like the beginning of a horror story. <laughs> seeing these eyes in the dark <laughs> yes while coming in the house <clears throat> but last night totally unrelated Zanchi brought in a snake oh wow gosh <laughs> it, it was not a really large snake but it was large enough so oh were you able to get it out <laughs> i was able to get it off with a broom yes i opened oh. the door and i kind of swept it out wow <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. i don't know where she is um both the kitties seem to be gone uh, okay, well, maybe we'll see them in a little bit. <laughs> well, my little kitty is right. She's here. Well, uh, I'm eager to talk to you today because uh, I read your new novel, Babysitter, uh, which is very tense and atmospheric and extremely thought provoking. And for people who haven't read the book yet, uh, just to uh, let them know, it primarily follows Hannah, an upper class wife and mother in 1970s Detroit, who engages in a dangerous affair, and a young man named Mikey, who has a troubled background and is a sort of fixer that takes care of dodgy jobs for nefarious men. And lurking in the background is a serial killer uh, who is murdering adolescent children in the city. So the story does such interesting things with time and characterization. So I'm eager to discuss how you wrote the book, but I, I first wanna ask you about the origins of the story. And I'm guessing the idea for this novel must have been gestating for many years, because I think I once heard in an interview where uh, you discussed your novel um, Zombie, which also features a serial killer, and how in writing that book, you initially wanted to write about the so-called babysitter killer, but instead created a character kind of close to a Jeffrey Dahmer uh, type individual. Um, so I was wondering what allowed you to finally feel able to write about this historic case from Detroit? Oh, Eric, I'm not sure really about the gestation. I think w much of what we write is sort of buried in the unconscious for long periods of time. So I began working on a novel that was similar to this in probably 1978. So that's oh, wow. such, a long, such a long time ago. Mm. So I must have written about 100 pages of that. And then I set it aside. It was the effect uh, in a in a community of there being a serial killer in the in that area because mm -hmm. I was quite good friends with women who had children in an age group in Birmingham and Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. So I saw these women quite often and I heard you know how they felt. Uh, they're kind of enshrined in the the scene where everyone they're all at this luncheon at the red the Red Fox Inn. Hmm. Now, the Red Fox Inn has a certain meaning in some quarters because that was where Jimmy Hoffa often dined when he uh -oh. was when he was in Detroit. And hmm. so Jimmy Hoffa was seen at the Red Fox restaurant uh, just before he disappeared. So I, th I think in Martin Scorsese's The Irishman, I think he's taken out of that restaurant. Huh. So, hmm. So actually, my women friends and I had lunch in this quite well-known restaurant in Bloomfield Hills. It's mm. I'm sure it's still there. It's it's a very elegant sort of like a big steakhouse, and uh, little did we know that there were, were organized crime figures also mm. in the room with us. So I definitely had a scene. I do have a chapter there, and mm -hmm. uh, it was it's sort of like an maybe like an in-joke for people who know the area. Hmm. What I was writing about it, I think originally, I probably didn't have that in, you know, 
there, there's much about the babysitter that we know now in 2022 that we didn't know in 1977 or 1978. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted to, to focus on the existential emotional urgency, the sense of anxiety of living in that time. So the, the novels in the historical present, whereas I'm now living much later and I'm looking back at it and I do know how it turned out. I do know there were approximately four or five victims. At the time, it wasn't known how many there would be. It could have gone on mm. indefinitely. And there are many things that we know about everything in life only years later. That's very true for the Detroit, the so-called riot of 1967, which is still in my, it's sort of a, a presence in my novel. Yes. And people are thinking about it. Mm. It was considered a race riot, you know, quotes around that expression. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that officially it's called a civil disturbance. Mm -hmm. But at the time, those of us who lived through it in Detroit, we really didn't know what was going on. It's only years later that we read about the, the, the brutality of Detroit city police toward black people and persons of color, how that precipitated this, uh, this disturbance. And so, too, with the babysitter, I know much more now by just going online than I ever knew at the time. Mm -hmm. I found it um, really fascinating how uh, the there isn't only the murder of children um, by a deranged serial killer in this novel, but also the state sanctioned murder of an innocent black man, um, which um, who is targeted by the police. And um, yet the public kind of accept this as justified and it quickly passes out of their mind um in in this novel and um and so your novel then is partly about those those racial tensions which um you were talking about which led to you know the so-called riot or rebellion in in Detroit um so yeah I was wondering if you could describe a bit more your experiences and understanding of the endemic racism uh in the city at that time and and um, and how you incorporated that into this novel as it kind of, it's kind of a shadow that like looms over the characters and you know um, and influences their opinions. Yes, when when the babysitter began abducting and murdering children, it was thought by some people that he would he might be a black man. You know, it's a mm -hmm. sort of this projection mm -hmm. of of a natural racist imagination you know and paranoia so, yeah yeah just um who would be doing this you know the people who we think are our adversaries or our enemies mm -hmm. so that's pretty much um like an undercurrent now we know because it's the structure of the novel is that of a thriller it's it's not doesn't have the pace of a thriller or the language of a thriller or even the plot of a thriller, but it has the structure of a thriller where we move about from perspective to perspective. Now, often in literary fiction, we might stay with one character or maybe another character, but we don't usually have that multiple perspective that you'll find in, in action movies where you're first you're with one side, then you're with the other side. So. Mm -hmm. the, the, the structure is very different from a, a mystery novel where the mystery is from one perspective and usually you find out what the mystery is as you go through the novel. You know who the killer is at the end. You know? mm -hmm. Whereas in this novel, it's pretty much indicated early on who the serial killer is. Mm -hmm. But the question is, will he ever be found out? Will he ever be stopped? That's a, a sort of a different way of looking at it. When I was originally going to write about this effect upon a community, the serial killer would be sort of in the background and there would be no access to, to his perspective or mm. perspective of people who knew him. But as it turned out, evidently, the babysitter committed suicide or he seemed to have committed suicide. So he's no longer living. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't sure, I mean, you can't be sure from reading online whether it was really a suicide or whether somebody killed him, you know. Yeah. So I, I use some of those open-ended questions. 
I loved her write about unsolved mysteries, like American mysteries that have never really been solved. There's been no conviction, nobody's in prison. Uh, you could have an inclination who might be guilty, like with the John Benet Ramsey case. People mm -hmm. have thoughts about it. And also with Babysitter. But there isn't anything literally official. Yeah, so it leaves room for the imagination for you to yes. create and speculate about yeah, possible possible outcomes. Uh, also, this um, this novel did begin as a short story, which was published in a magazine and then an anthology of best horror um, back in 2006. And, and it was also uh, reprinted in your short story collection, Sourland. Um, so I, I was wondering what made you decide to expand this story into a novel when you initially wrote it? Did you, do you think that it was done now, but then it sort of lingered in your mind or, or did you, uh, did you always plan to, to write more extensively about this case? No, I didn't necessarily plan to write extensively about it. I had written that novel, a part of a novel back in 1978. And mm. so it sort of lingered in my mind. And this idea of uh, when you live in Detroit in that area, you've spent a lot of time driving around on these expressways. <laughs> you say you're driving on the John Lodge Expressway, you're driving on the Henry Ford Expressway, you're driving along. Somehow the whole novel is a kind of hypnotic dream of Detroit where you're in your car and you're driving, <laughs> you're driving to the, into the inner city of Detroit. Well, I had done that. Um, some very rarely alone, but sometimes with my husband, Ray Smith, it's a, and then you're driving home at night. And anyway, it's sort of a hallucinatory novel, very much about about the streets of Detroit and the, the expressways, uh, you know, the avenues like Woodward Avenue and Brashard Avenue. Mm -hmm. People who are from Detroit, a small, probably very, very small, decreasing number of people just love to kind of, rhapsodize about the, the driving around the city and the, and the different streets. I think I once wrote a prose poem that was all in the street names of, of Detroit. <laughs> so naturally when I, I thought of Hannah and maybe in the original story, maybe she doesn't even have a name. So there's a person in a vehicle and she's driving into the inner city like why would you drive from Far Hills into the inner city? What is the reason? It's like a gravitational pull. Mm. So there's something sort of hallucinatory about about the whole novel. Well, yeah, and particularly in um, the beginning, because it uh, it focuses so much on this primary action, uh, which takes place in a very short space of you know it's 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 uh, it doesn't take very long to complete this action but but basically for the first 50 pages of the novel it focuses on hannah um arriving at this hotel and in a glass elevator ascending to the 61st floor and walking to room 6183 and this thoroughly engrosses us because in her psychological state I mean, we feel so with her and learn pieces about her past but it continuously revolves back to the elevator's ascent and walking down a corridor and and it is hypnotic or or hallucinatory, you know, as you describe in, in how it locks the reader in the minutiae of this journey, this very short journey. And it reminded me actually of books like um, The Mezzanine by, by Nicholson Baker or, um, or writing from, you know, the Nouveau Roman and like Alain Rob Grier. And um, so, so I was wondering, yeah, what inspired you to focus so intensely on this minimal amount of of action of of her riding up the elevator and walking down the corridor at the beginning of of the novel well i think when we are we're approaching some experience in our lives that may turn out to be traumatic or even like the end of our lives it may be like the catastrophe the real ultimate mistake of your life it's the preliminary um the anticipation or the apprehension uh, those there were more chapters which were just her getting there. And she and each one of them, it always ends with seeing the sign, do not disturb. You know, like mm -hmm. the whole novel 
the novel ends with that sign, do not disturb. Do we dare knock on the door? Or do we dare actually disturb, you know, disturb this uh, sort of soporific entrancement that are that is our lives? It's sort of synonymous, I think, or identical with leaving your life, you know, that maybe Hen is actually is actually dead. She was actually murdered by this person when she, you know, when the door is open, that's sort of like the end of the the end of the movie. And I imagine the novel as a kind of film that's that's always taking place. But it was longer and there were more of these hallucinatory passages. Mm. Like one in one variant, she decides not to go. She's up and she comes, she doesn't knock on the door. She just goes, she leaves. Mm. So that was a variant that I took out. I could have left it in. I just feel that leading up to traumatic events in our lives, I can think of a couple in my own life. It's it's that preliminary passage toward what will happen that keeps running like a loop, like a film loop. I can wake up at four in the morning and I'm back in that loop and I'm I'm approaching something that actually happened, you know, a few years ago. But in my thoughts about it, I'm still approaching it. And it's like, well, maybe this time something different will happen. You could think of what the worst experience of your life was, and then you put yourself back into like an hour before. Mm -hmm. And I find that is so obsessively fascinating to me. So everything is so real to me, driving on the expressway and going into the elevator, or try, you know, park in the car, the valet park parking attendant takes your car you're going into this gated city and the renaissance center is uh it's sort of like an island or oasis in the city of detroit which is mostly now rubble mm -hmm. just this area at, by, down by the waterfront by the detroit river is a very valuable property but like so much in the united states there's extreme poverty mm -hmm. and almost desolation just a couple miles away from extraordinary affluence. Mm. And a lot of the affluence, I think we just have to concede is uh, the consequence of graft and corruption, political graft and corruption. Mm. So it's like a microcosm of, a, of America. And, you know, speaking of structures, I know you intend to talk a little bit about, about Blonde, but when I had seen a photograph of Marilyn Monroe taken mm. just before she died. It may have been the day before. She looks quite sad and she doesn't look glamorous. She looks sad. She's in the backyard of her house, I think in Brentwood. Mm -hmm. And on, on the ground is a little stuffed animal. Mm -hmm. And I thought I'll structure the whole novel around that. So I struck, I structured babysitter around this do not disturb sign, mm -hmm. which that's in the first chapter. And it's the last thing we see. And then it, it's, it's other places in the novel. I think if you can find a kind of mysterious image. Now, the stuffed animal in that picture, according to the biographer, was never explained. Mm. She got a package in the mail. She was sitting in a backyard. This is on the ground, sort of behind her in the grass. Like, it's just sort of fallen down. Mm. She's not looking at it. And I thought to myself, that is such a clue about her death and maybe her life. Like, why did she die that night? And I'm not sure that anybody even noticed it in my novel. Mm. But I think that the movie, I'm not remembering absolutely clearly. I think the movie might begin with the messenger bringing it. Okay. I, haven't seen, I haven't seen the movie for quite a while now. Mm. I mean, I've seen I've seen Andrew Dominic's movie, but not just not recently. Right. But you know, when you're a novelist, and I know you're a writer also, you're so interested in structure. Like if you can get the structure mm. with a dominant image and it holds everything together em emotionally and sort of in terms of imagery. But until you get that, I don't think you can really write something that has cohesion. Mm. It's really interesting you say that because I wanted to, to ask about this um, 
you know, this tension you have in in Babysitter um, regarding both Hannah and Mikey's fates, um, where we're giving clues about possibilities of possible occurrences and outcomes in their lives, as, as you've already said, of what ha- might have happened to her when she went into that hotel room. And so like time is not necessarily linear for these characters and they they feel caught in this loop as as you described and and it is quite eerie and disturbing um when when reading it um so yeah i was wondering if you could discuss these characters relationship with with time and um and what drew you to to creating this this ambiguity and tension uh, in the story well i'm very drawn to certain personalities and uh, one of the reasons that we write i think is is discovering and sort of cultivating and presenting personalities, often in terms of their their observations of life and their dialogue. You know, so so Mikey was one of my favorite characters. Like Dawn in my novel, uh, a book of American martyrs. Dawn is this girl. <laughs> she's this girl. She's not very literate. I mean, she would never read any of my books, but she becomes a boxer. She's a, a like a woman boxer, and I was just so. Uh, just utterly thrilled and fascinated with her her personality, her character, the way she reacts to life. Mm-hmm. Uh, Quint, Quentin P. in uh, the zombie, he is another personality. So di- I can think the more different they are from my own, mm-hmm. the more fascinating they are. Quentin is like a sociopath, and what does it mean to see the world from the perspective of a sociopath? You know, all the things that matter so much to us like a cat or a kitten or a baby or your best friend, uh, somehow don't matter to those people, but they have their other things that do matter to them. So Mikey was a an or he was an orphan, sort of like Marilyn Monroe in the sense that she, he was given away by his mother, but he he was not an orphan in a legal sense. He could not be adopted out of this uh, boy's home which may or may not exist in Royal Oak, Michigan. There may be something like that, a Catholic boy's home, or it may be that I totally invented it because I I actually haven't lived in Detroit for quite a while. Mm. But he is somebody who, who sort of like Norman Jean Baker, just sort of comes out of nowhere, you know, no real mother, no father, and like an orphan. Like what does it mean to be an orphan? in a world in which everybody has families. So Mikey wants to establish himself as having a strong identity. He thinks that by doing things for YK, he's ingratiating himself with this stronger personality. But then he sort of gets attracted to Hannah. She feeds him, as he said, the most fantastic meal of his life. And from her point of view, she just wants him not to kill her. So Mm. she's giving him food and she's flattering him. She's doing anything she can to kind of placate this person that she perceives as sort of a wild card, you know, which is true. Yeah, and who's intruded upon her house, yeah. Yeah, but he doesn't really mean, he doesn't mean to hurt her. Mm. He has a kind of confused feeling that she's sort of like his old mother, you know, and and then when she feeds him, there's sort of a bond between them. He thinks, you know, it doesn't exist. So then... Uh, he actually becomes the moral center of the novel because he is the one, the only person who actually destroys the babysitter. He kills him. Mm-hmm. Now, it's what we call extrajudicial killing, you know, or vigilante killing. You find acts like this in novels, I think, m- maybe more than in real life. But often in, often in novels, as in real life, Justice moves very slowly, mm-hmm. and it would be the case that babysitter, uh, the actual person babysitter, would probably not ever have been caught by the police. The re- the the historical person was, he was arrested a few times for soliciting sex from a minor, I think, but he was never convicted of anything, mm-hmm. and though he probably did hurt people physically it may have actually he may have been the murderer it it was quite likely that he would never he would never be stopped Mm -hmm. because he always had protectors 
what makes the novel so contemporary to me now is that there's a lot about enablers and like a network of people making it possible for the babysitter to keep doing his crimes. Yeah. Now in 1977 and 1978, nobody was thinking about that. People thought of lone wolf, you know, isolated killers all by themselves. But in 2022, you can read about pedophile rings in parts of the United States, and the pedophile ring will protect one. They will protect one another. Some of these are in in prisons too. The, the there's a kind of loose, maybe it's a loose allegiance or a bond that these people have with one another. So babysitter did belong to something like that. I don't mean that there was a literal club or society. It was more like men who kind of knew one another. Mm -hmm. And today they share images on online. They share some sort of you know child pornography online. But at the time of my novel, that was 1977, and there wasn't anything, there was no no social media. Mm. But because they were in positions of privilege and power as well, that helped yeah. enable the, the, their actions. Yeah. yeah, you really only need one person who has enough power and money. Mm -hmm. And he can help, he can help a lot of people. And then there's a lot of blackmail in that world too. Like it's thought that Jeffrey Epstein made millions and millions of dollars by blackmail. I mean, it's pretty much understood that Jeffrey Epstein was blackmailing uh, his his so-called friends and colleagues. Yeah. And the babysitter was in that world. If he was really the son of a, G a General Motors executive, as it was thought, he would have a lot of money. Mm. So he's probably paying money to, to people. However, I do want to stress that this is just in the background of the novel. The foreground of the novel is really a family, Hannah and her family. Well, yeah, and I, I wanted to um to ask you about Hannah because uh, I think in some ways it would be very easy to criticize um, her character for her superficiality as she's so focused on brand labels and social status and she takes her housekeeper for granted and is often very rude to her and she frequently neglects her children uh, unless she's been hysterically attentive to them. Um, but she also had a difficult upbringing uh, with a possibly uh, violent or abusive father and her, her husband is frequently absent and callous towards her and she seems to have no close friends and she becomes trapped in, in this perilous or, or even deadly um, situation. So, so I was wondering what was it about Hannah as an individual that captured your imagination and made her the, the focus of this novel? Well, I just really identify with Hannah on some level. Mm. She's like a character in, in Do With Me What You Will, another, another yes. uh, somewhat passive, a person who who is afraid to have much agency in her own life. Mm. She, she perceives her own identity in terms of other people. Now, it, it is a question for all of us, I think, what is our identity? You know, one can be very dismissive or disdainful of people who crave to be loved, like Norma Jean Baker also had this craving to be loved. But when you think about it, the existence that we have in other to other people is so much a part of our self-worth, mm. you know. If there is literally no one, literally no one in the world who cares about you or mm. who really worries that you're not feeling well, who calls you on the phone, who touches your hand, you actually find it's very difficult to live that way. Mm. So when a woman like Hannah is very anxious about her appearance and the clothes she's wearing, and she's trying to make herself into like Leslie Caron, you know, with a sort of little girl affect, I see a person who is existentially very desperate. It's like you're hanging on by your fingernails for some identity. Mm. That is why women will stay with abusive husbands and uh, stay in abusive relationships because that man, though he may be beating her and hurting her, nonetheless, he does have a feeling for her. There's some emotional bond and she has an identity. 
uh, people are very impatient with women who stay with their abusers. But I understand why they do that. Also, Hannah wants to be punished. Mm. She feels that she deserves to be punished. So she keeps going back to this man who is punishing her. But she has this fantasy, well, but he really is testing me. Mm. It's just a test. And he'll say, well, you know, Hannah, I really love you. And she's so eager to believe that, like a cult, a member of a cult mm. will forgive the cult leader anything. Mm. No matter what the cult leader says or does, the cult follower will still love him and, and believe in him. Yeah, and so in having this affair, it don't, she almost like attaches herself to it because, yeah, it, she doesn't feel like she has much self-worth outside of, of that, yeah. Yeah, well, I was reading Claire, I think it was Clara Bloom's memoir uh, some years ago. Clara Bloom had relationships with men who were very dominant and very hurtful to her, like Philip Roth. And mm. she mentioned, she's a very beautiful woman. She mentions in the memoir, oh, of course, I knew many men who were very nice, who were wonderful men, who were warm and loving who would never hurt me, but I didn't, I wasn't attracted to them. And that really leapt out to me because Clara Bloom is a woman of such beauty mm. and poise. One can assume she could have had a, a very happy marriage with a, with a good man, a nice man who would respect her. She was drawn to these other men. And of course, Philip Roth really hurt her. Mm. He hurt her terribly. And she sort of met her match with him but there are women like that and i think in many cases they are very beautiful women they can easily like with a snap of their fingers as easily get a very nice man you know mm -hmm. like a, a screwball comedy where there's a very nice man played by jimmy stewart or Cary grant you know somebody who's really nice but these women don't actually want that kind of man they don't find that kind of man exciting mm -hmm. I must say I wasn't like that. <laughs> yeah, no, of course. <laughs> but in a I, I, I was actually afraid. I would actually have been very afraid mm. of any man who was even slightly abusive. I, I wouldn't find that dramatically exciting or challenging. Mm. I, would have run, I would have just run out, run away. Mm. Now you um you often use such arrestingly powerful descriptions in your writing. And there's there's one section which I found so unsettling uh, where you, um, you write this passage uh, where you say, children plucking at mommy's heart, tearing out handfuls of mommy's flesh. Mommy's love for these small antic creatures is a soft, warm taffy stopping up her throat, can't chew, can't swallow, can't spit it out and the the familiarity of a parent's love for her children is turned into something absolutely terrifying and this is paired alongside the the attention the the serial killer gives to the children who become his victims as well as the favor a priest gives to mikey when he's young um so i was wondering if you could speak about the unique ways that you defamiliarize our common concepts of love and nurturing uh, in in this novel well I'm, what i'm writing from the point of view of a pr the perspective of a character it's not so much my own voice it's the mediated voice so that she literally feels like she's suffocating and that her children are so they mean so much to her like that she her identity is bound up with these children she be, as you said, she she sometimes is hysterical about taking care of them. And it's really only the the sudden realization that YK is taking her son away from her. She suddenly realizes she's got to get out of that relationship. So it was the love of her child, her son, in that instance, that really saved her life. Mm -hmm. She takes the son away and she drives away and she's, she breaks a spell with, with YK. But with the with the serial killer, the babysitter says that he ha he has to kill this boy because he loves him too much. Mm. He loves he loves him so much he can't bear it. He he can't stand loving this boy. He says he'll make him into a star. 
he'll take him to the Caribbean. Um, he'll have a special swimming pool. He makes all these promises to him. And then he finally realizes that he just has to kill him. Uh, that is not, it's not a normal way of feeling, of course, but I think we can understand that. Uh, there are people who are so anxious about their children. If they once had a scare, like a health scare or accident, or they say they saw an accident when they were young of a child being killed, they, they never get over that anxiety, that fear that something will happen to the one individual you've been entrusted with, you know, mm. like somebody puts a baby in your, in your arms, it's your baby. Mm. And do you love that baby? And it's very exciting, but suddenly it dawns on some people, as Shakespeare said, children are hostages to fortune. You're never, ever going to be free of a terror of losing that loved one. And if it's a small child, it is your responsibility. Mm -hmm. You got to keep them alive. So Hannah is kind of overwhelmed by this. Mm -hmm. I think that the 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 priest is more a man of the world. He is what we would call a pedophile, but he's somebody who is not crazy. He's not crazy. He's not a psychopath. He's not going to hurt these boys. They kind of passed through his orphanage, and he was when he was younger very handsome. And Mikey remembers seeing a priest walking along with a long skirt. And Mikey said, he just, you know, how he loved, how he loved these, these priests, you know, because Mikey was an orphan. He didn't have a father in his life. And to see the priest walking when, when they're younger and they're very handsome, uh, they, they represent such a force, such an attractive force, uh, not to me, but, but to somebody like Mikey. Mm -hmm. And then when the priest gets older, he may have Parkinson's. He's not handsome anymore. But Mikey still, Mikey still loves him. You know, he mm -hmm. says, well, I sort of wanted to kill him, but now maybe I'll just have a drink with him and we'll have a nap together. And so that chapter ends on this sort of cozy reconciliation, which I thought was very tender. I don't know how other people would feel about it. But... Mm -hmm. I mean, it does challenge your ideas about, yeah, what tenderness and, and love sort of mean in, in that way um, when presented with this story and that you're so engrossed in their um, psychology and, and so that you can really understand their positions and how they might desire things which they know, you know, aren't or might realize later that are not good for them. And, yeah. Um, and it's, it's interesting, too, how um, in some sections of the novel, um, you do actually inhabit some of the serial killers' victims on the perspective, their perspective um, in, in some quite short sections. Um, so I, I was wondering if you were ever tempted to write this novel entirely through their perspectives, or or did it feel necessary to have more distance from the killer by focusing primarily on on Hannah's character? Oh well, I would have never read a whole novel from the point of view of of uh, characters who are sort of marginal. I mean, they're the victims, but the action or the agency belongs to the killer and then people who are dealing with him. So um, I'm thinking of Marie Claire Blay, who was a Canadian writer. She would do something like that where everything is very poetic and kind of immersed in the subjectivity. You might not know who this person is. So sort of like being underwater and you don't know you don't know who it is. Uh, I, I, I personally would never write a novel like that. But mm. it's a, it's a a contrast. Like you have one scene that's like a movie, where she's moving along, and the sentences are very, the paragraphs are very short. Mm. And then you have another section where it's very uh, like a prose poem, sort of dense. Mm. And then there might be another chapter that's more dialogue. So I'm conscious of these contrasts in the texture of the prose. And um, just sort of um, ending on babysitter, I was wondering, since the figure of the serial killer um, was someone you wanted to write about for so long, and um, I'm wondering if there are any other specific historic or 
notorious figures from the past who particularly fascinate you or seem emblematic of something about American culture. Um, yeah, are there any other particular figures you can think of? And, and do you think you ever might write about them? Well, that's an interesting question. I did write about John Benet Ramsey. Mm. And in my novel, Mysteries of Winter Turn, there are three, uh, three mysteries that were not exactly solved. I mean, they're not literally the mysteries, but I based my novel on on these mysteries. Well, Lizzie Borden was one. Mm. Yeah. What is she was never convicted, but yes, I I would I would if I could find something that was kind of talismanic, you know, emblematic of something beyond itself, mm. like writing about the Chappaquiddick incident. Mm -hmm involving Ted Kennedy and Mary Jo Kopechny, that was really made to order because it's like it's like a ballad. It's like a, a fairy tale. A very powerful man uh, betrays and abandons a very naive, loving young girl. And, it, and there was a plot and that was sort of like something that one would want to write about from the point of view, in that case, of the victim. But if you can think of any, <laughs> well, what happened to Jimmy Hoffa? That's that's a question, but everybody's tried to answer that. So I just want to hold it. I want to hold up the American cover. Which uh, is yeah, so yeah, it's interesting the the difference. Isn't it between. interesting? Yeah, because mm. it, uh, the UK focuses on the missing ch children. Yeah, with the snow okay. covered. Yeah, mm. and that's so. Yeah, and the American is like a a tabloid newspaper, and here's a car, and that's very important because mm. it's Motor City, and then here's a woman's face, and then there's the headlines, you know. Yeah, it's, because the media did come up with that label, didn't they? Of, of yeah, the it, was, it was the media. He was originally called the Oakland County Child Killer. Mm. But the color also, like, it was this lurid red, mm. and everything was like a tabloid. Mm. It just seemed sort of um, the contrast to the U.K., yeah. And, and America is kind of embodied in that. Yeah, that's interesting. I like them both. I think both both perspectives are are very interesting. So, Eric, if you can think of an exemplary unsolved mystery in America, I would so appreciate <laughs> hearing it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I I know there has been um, a novel written from the the point of view or about Lizzie Borden. Um, I think called "See What I've Done." I'm trying to remember the author's name, but um, was was a very good novel. But um, yeah, I'll try to think of uh, other figures that, that would uh, make a, make interesting subjects. I'm sure there's many. <laughs> well, as Balzac said, "Behind every fortune is a crime." Mm. Now, in in America, behind every fortune and behind every political dynasty or political power there are so many crimes of corruption and deals and so forth that it's sort of almost overwhelming for a novelist to even try to take on anything like that mm. i mean we're in such a crisis in the united states of morale our culture is so fragmented and divisive and the, the approximately one quarter of the population doesn't even believe in a reality you know like that there's a president who was elected and his name is Biden. Right. A lot of millions of people actually don't believe that, which is so bizarre. You know, it's like <laughs> it's like saying that you don't believe, you know, that London is in is in England. No, London's not in England. And you think, well, how can I convince you? <laughs> you know, there's yeah. seems literally no way no to logic. convince. You. Yeah, it's it's actually so bizarre. Mm. So for writers real chaos and real craziness are impossible to write about um can i ask what your what new writing projects you're you're working on at the moment well i'm just finishing up a, a novel that's about really about the 19th century it's called butcher it's based on three representative men of medicine in the 19th century and uh, all three of them exploited women in, in ways, some of them quite gruesome. One is J. Miriam Sims, S-I-M-S. He's called the father of, Amer of modern gynecology. So he was living around the 1850s, 1860s. He was experimenting on black women and slave women. 
mm. uh, without any anesthesia. Some of them he helped, you know, because he was doing surgery, but basically he was experimenting on human beings. Mm. But I, then another one is Weir Mitchell. He may be less known now, but he was very famous as a, a man of science in the 19th century. He was actually a novelist and a writer as well. He is the person who invented the so-called rest cure that Charlotte Perkins Gilmore writes about in the huh. yellow wallpaper. Huh. So that's that's Dr. That's Weir Mitchell. Huh. Huh. Yeah. Now the rest cure for women was bed. If you read the yellow wallpaper, that was mm. it. And then eating very rich foods like butter and milk and sweet things to gain weight. Whereas the rest, the cure for men that Weir Mitchell devised was action to send them out hunting, like on horseback. <laughs> so I think that Teddy Roosevelt benefited from that. Mm. So if you were a man, then you went out into the world and did things physically with your body. But if you were a woman, woman, you were sent to bed. Like it's confined, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So men, many, I think many a many a woman was probably destroyed by that. I mean, how many women maybe committed suicide? They were taking laudamin. The doctors prescribed these awful medications. Mm. Basically, I think looking at it now that the woman was supposed to be a child bear, you know, lie in bed, gets impregnated and gives birth. That, it almost seemed like that. Mm. Then, the, then the other one is more late 19th century, early 20th century. His name was Henry Cotton. He was the director of the New Jersey State Asylum for Lunatics in in uh, in Trenton, and the word lunatics is in the title of the of the asylum, mm. because in those days they they were not politically correct. Right. You could be a lunatic, you know, and that you would be called a lunatic. Mm. New Jersey State Asylum for Lunatics, and this is only about twenty miles from where I'm sitting right now, mm. and I've done a, a lot of research into him, especially. So the novel is about one man who embodies a, a lot of these three men. It's a composite figure. Uh -huh. It's set in about 1850, 1860, and going up until 1870 or so. But it does have a kind of happy ending, actually. Uh -huh. I would call it a surreal, grotesque romance. Butcher. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a... That's a uh, that's a really interesting genre category to <laughs> um, to characterize that book as well. Yeah, it sounds really really interesting. Okay, well, um, well, yeah, great. Thank you. I, I look forward to that. And um, yeah, thank you so much for uh, discussing both um, uh, Babysitter and uh, and Blonde with me. Um, it's always really fascinating to hear hear your thoughts. Um, are, are the cats around? Well, <laughs> no, I'm so sorry. Before, before, before you were there, Zanchi actually walked right across the screen. She was on screen. Uh, but but there's one kitty. I'll see if this kitty will be here. just to say hello. Ah, uh, hello. She's, she's not like Zanchi. Zanchi loves Zoom, but Lilith. <laughs> yeah, it's more shy. <laughs> uh, she's more like a normal cat. But Zanchi would preen and kind of show her whiskers and <laughs> things. And I think she's outside now. <laughs> okay, find uh, another snake. <laughs> I know people are so disappointed not to see Zanchi. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Well, thank you so much, Joyce. Uh, Always nice to talk to you, Eric. Lovely to see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>